<laughs> Only seems fair to me. I think I'm, yes, that is recording. Okay, so we're going to continue today with our discussion of bacterial exotoxins. And we're, we're going to start with uh, one of the paradigms in bacterial exotoxins called diphtheria toxin. So this is a toxin that's produced by a bacterium called Carinobacterium diphtheriae, which causes a disease called diphtheria, which you're all vaccinated against. And luckily, because most of the world is vaccinated against it, this disease is incredibly rare today. Only a handful of cases in the U.S. every year. So even those of you who go into medicine will never probably ever actually see diphtheria unless you travel to another part of the world. Um, we study this because this is one of the best known toxins, and it's also uh, a paradigm for other toxins in this class. So the diphtheria toxin is a member of a class of toxins that we've discussed a little bit before when we talked about the cholera toxin. These are toxins that are known as AB toxins. In other words, there are two um, forms or, or two proteins. One is the A or active fragment. In this case, that by active, what we really mean is enzymatically active. So in this class of toxins, the A subunit is an active enzyme. So as you'll see, because it's an enzyme, because it can do the same process over and over again, you can literally kill one cell with one molecule of this toxin. It's a very, these toxins are very effective. The B, or the second portion of the, of the protein, is B standing for binding. It's what accomplishes the ability of the toxin to bind to specific receptors on the, on the cells. So one molecule of DTX, or this is how we abbreviate toxins, diphtheria toxin, is sufficient to kill one cell because of this enzymatic activity. Now, this enzymatic activity is not specific to diphtheria toxin. The enzymatic activity that we're talking about here is ADP, or it's adenosyl diphosphate ribosylase. This enzymatic activity, the ability to take that molecule, ADP ribose, and to put it onto a target, is done by numerous bacterial toxins. What differs chiefly is the target of that process of ADP ribosylation. In the case of cholera toxin, the ADP ribosylase activity of cholera toxin puts an ADP ribose onto that regulatory subunit that controls adenyl cyclase to lock adenyl cyclase on so that cyclic AMP levels rise to produce that characteristic diarrhea. In the case of um, diphtheria toxin, What's specifically ADP ribosylated is a different protein. It's an elongation factor, elongation factor 2, so part of the eukaryotic ribosome. So now by sticking this large molecule, this ADP ribose, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the structure of, of this in another slide. By sticking this ADP ribose onto elongation factor 2, that makes the eukaryotic ribosome absolutely non-functional. It destroys it. And because the DTX is an enzyme, it can not only um, put an ADP ribose onto one uh, protein, th this elongation factor, it can turn around an ADP ribosylate over and over and over again. So it can basically eliminate protein translation within that host cell to kill that cell. We'll talk a little, I'm going to show you some more slides and we'll talk a little bit more about the function, but be because my interest is disease, let's talk a little bit about the disease diphtheria. Because although you might not see it, it actually can come back very quickly. So what happened when the Soviet Union um, dissolved into its individual federated states was that because of financial problems in those former Soviet states, one of the first things to go was money for public health and for vaccines. So the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus toxin are toxoid vaccines that you all get and all Soviet children used to get suddenly weren't being given quite as much. So even though in the former Soviet Union diphtheria was as rare as it is in the U.S. today, it only took a few years for of, of decreased amounts of vaccination to have major outbreaks of diphtheria in, in places like um, Kyrgyzstan and in Georgia. And this is typically affecting children, and this is often a very fatal disease. 
And although I don't know why this projector some days doesn't work very well, but, but the place of infection of this carinobacterium diphtheriae that's capable of producing the diphtheria toxin is in the pharynx. And so what it does is by producing that toxin, bless you, it has the ability to kill cells in the pharynx. And so those cells will form this membranous um, or pseudomembrane, very similar to the pseudomembranous colitis that we talked about that, that Clostridium difficile does. But now the pseudomembrane is being formed um, in the respiratory tract. So the problem here can be, and the reason why this can be so fatal, especially in children, is that they, they will actually suffocate in their sleep because these um, pseudomembranes can actually break off and lodge in the trachea and cause suffocation. But even in children who survive uh, the possibility of suffocation by this, these um, pseudomembranes, the toxin being produced locally here in the back of the throat in the pharynx is actually absorbed into the bloodstream, so a process known as toxemia. We talked about bacteremia and viremia when these things are sp spread in the blood. It's the same thing when it's a non-living organism. When it's the protein toxin, like diphtheria toxin, spread in the blood, that's a process called toxemia. And that toxin can actually do damage um, systemically throughout, throughout the body. But it's particularly dangerous, and, and some of the severe side effects, or not, I shouldn't say side effects, the severe effects of diphtheria occur in the nervous system, the heart, and the kidneys. These, are all, these can all be damaged. So this is a very serious um, disease. This is what the, um, this doesn't project very well, but you can kind of see what's going on here. Here's a pseudomembrane in the back of the throat of somebody, a child who's, who's suffering from diphtheria. So you can imagine your panic if you looked in the, in the back of your throat in the morning when you were brushing your teeth and saw that gray um, mass of necrotic tissue that's, that, that can potentially break off. It's a nasty disease. But this is one of those cool diseases. I hesitate to talk about a fatal disease as being cool in that its entire etiology, everything that causes this disease can be traced to one single toxin. There's not the necessity for endotoxins. As a matter of fact, this is a gram-positive bacteria, so there is no endotoxin. There is no lipopolysaccharide. There aren't other toxins. There's not this major inflammatory response that adds to it. What's really killing the cells and ultimately potentially killing the patient is a single protein toxin. We've talked about it a little bit before when we talked about bacteriophage. Because remember that this particular toxin, the diphtheria toxin, is encoded by a bacteriophage. So only strains of Carinobacterium diphtheriae, which are lysogenic for a particular Carinobacteriophage called beta, only those strains of the Carinobacteria are capable of causing diphtheria. If they don't have that particular virus lysogenized in them, this bacteria just hangs out in the back of your throat like hundreds of other species of bacteria and does no harm. It's only when it's lysogenized by that virus because that virus encodes this diphtheria toxin. So again, it's a dimeric toxin. It's an exotoxin, meaning that it's secreted from the bacterium. And interestingly, the bacterium only really sense, or excuse me, only really produces this toxin under iron stressed conditions. And that's a really interesting fact because one of the ways that we as vertebrates have evolved to try and limit bacterial infections is to limit their access to iron because iron is such a critical cofactor for things like the electron transport chain that we and the bacteria that are associated with us are constantly in competition for that iron. So we do everything we can, like things like um, ferritin, um, lactoferritin, all of these proteins, um, transferrin, all the proteins that we have that bind iron very tightly are kind of designed to keep iron away from these enemy bacteria. But in this particular case, the bacterium says, well, screw you. I'm going to turn, I'm going to ramp this up a notch. If you're going to deny me iron, I'm going to produce a toxin, which is going to kill cells and release the intracellular stores of iron within those cells. From the bacteria's point of view, this is exactly what it's trying to do. By using this toxin, secreting this toxin, uh, which will now bind to the tracheal epithelial cells, eventually killing them, these cells have got iron stores within them that can now be scavenged by the bacteria. So 
Um, if we just didn't try and limit iron, if we weren't selfish with our iron, perhaps this bacteria wouldn't produce um, the toxin or produce as much toxin. But the toxin binds to a specific receptor on the surface of a respiratory epithelial cell. This receptor is, is related to epidermal growth factor receptor, so it's an essential protein that cells are producing. And it will initiate a classic receptor-mediated endocytotic event. So clathrin-coated pits will form, an endosome will form. And now, just like in the case of influenza, when these cells have sensed that they've taken something into an endosome, they try to kill it. Um, and so one of the ways that they do it, just, just like when we were talking about influenza, is that that endosome will be acidified. So protons are pumped in to decrease the acid to hopefully kill whatever parasite or fungus or bacterium has, has gone into that endocytic vesicle. But again, just like in the case of influenza, this strategy actually backfires on the host because the diphtheria toxin actually requires that acidification. What happens when the internal environment of this endosome is acidified down to about a pH of 5, this AB toxin literally inverts itself in the membrane. What happens is that the B, it's not shown well in this particular slide, but this B portion will actually insert itself into the lipid bilayer of the endosome and expose the A portion, the active portion, to the cytoplasm, where it will be reduced and freed. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But this AB toxin is actually held, it's actually two peptides held together only by a disulfide linkage between cysteines. So when this A fragment or the active fragment is exposed to the surface, to the cytoplasm of the cell, under the control of acidification of that endosome, that disulfide linkage is reduced. The cytoplasm is a very um, reducing environment. There's a lot of places, or there's a lot of electron carriers going around with electrons looking for places to put them. Hopefully they're putting them into the electron transport chain. But they'll put their electrons into a disulfide linkage very well also. That's going to release the active portion of, or of this diphtheria toxin, which now is going to target specifically elongation factor 2 of the ribosome. That protein is going to be now have an adduct added onto it, a, a chemical addition to it, specifically this ADP ribose. So ADP ribose is coming from a molecule that you're all familiar with. We talked about NAD plus a lot when we talked about glycolysis and the electron transport chain. This is the very um, important electron uh, carrier within the cells. What happens is the diphtheria toxin will take that NAD and chop it up. It will break it into two molecules. It releases the nicotinamide portion free into the cytoplasm, but it takes the remaining portion, which is the ADP ribose, and covalently links it to elongation factor 2, thus completely inactivating that elongation factor, and now the ribosomes that would use that can't function. So, and this happens over and over again, because remember, it's important to remember that the diphtheria toxin is an enzyme. It doesn't just do this once. It's not used up. The toxin itself is not attached to elongation factor 2. It's stealing a portion of NAD, sticking it onto that electron, uh, that elongation factor, and eliminating its function, and moving on and doing it again. So this will completely inhibit protein synthesis in the cells, and the cells will die. It's also stopping the cell from mounting any type of an antibacterial response, or possibly even calling for help, because an infected cell will oftentimes produce things like cytokines, to call for inflammatory cell help to recruit neutrophils. Um, this, this strategy of stopping protein synthesis perhaps helps the bacterium to eliminate the inflammatory response before it even begins. This is a little bit more on the diphtheria toxin at the protein level. It's a little bit different. So I've told you that it's the paradigm for this AB toxin family. But structurally, it's very different than the other AB toxins. So we've already talked about the cholera toxin. We'll talk about it again. And we're going to talk about the heat labile toxin that E. coli produces, which is almost identical to the cholera toxin. Those toxins, in those two toxins, the cholera and E. coli toxin, the A and the B subunits are completely different proteins made from completely different genes. 
This is why diphtheria toxin is a little bit unusual um, to be the paradigm. It's actually encoded by a single gene and synthesized by a single, um, as a single protein. Here are the disulfide linkages. But in order for this toxin to be active, the protein, excuse me, the bacterium has to first um, proteolytically cleave this protein. So it releases the amino terminal fraction from the carboxy terminal fraction of the protein. But they're still held together by these disulfide links. So this would be um, two cysteine amino acids, one on the amino terminal fragment, one on the carboxy terminal fragment. And so those two peptides are held together, not by a peptide bond, they originally came from the same protein, but now they're held together only by disulfides. So that when the acidification occurs inside the endosome, this B fragment, shown here on the top, the binding fragment, actually will now insert itself into the membrane of that endosome. And in doing so, it actually turns it inside out. And it makes this active site be exposed to the cytoplasm, where that sulfide uh, can be re um, reduced, and now that releases fragment A. A for active, in this case, enzymatically active. So, again, this is, this ADP ribosylation is a common theme among many bacterial toxins. It's not, you know, just something that we find with diphtheria toxin. But in the case of something like cholera toxin, which we talked about in an earlier section, um, here is an AB toxin. So here's the active portion of a toxin like cholera toxin. It would have now associated with it five distinct proteins, five identical copies of the B protein made by a different gene and a different protein. Whether we're talking about Vibrio cholera toxin, E. coli heat labile toxin, or diphtheria toxin, all of those toxins very distinct from one another, or at least the diphtheria toxin is very distinct, all have the same activity. They have the ability to take NAD. So this is the structure of the electron carrier NAD. Here's the nicotinamide portion shown at the top. Here's the adenine portion shown, shown at the bottom. In all of these toxins, what they're going to do She's right here. Do you want to talk to her? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was some kind of a request. I don't know what's going on. Um, I probably should have listened to it instead of playing a joke. I hope everything is okay. <laughs> that was... That, oh, okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Man, I can imagine, like, you know, Somebody gets hurt because professor plays a joke, right? Um, so anyway, what happens is that the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is cleaved by each one of these toxins, and it will always put on the ADB ribose portion. That's the portion shown here on the, on the left, and that becomes covalently attached to the target protein. The only thing that differs is the target. In the case of diphtheria toxin, the target is elongation factor 2. In the case of Vibrio cholera toxin, the, the, sub, or the, the target is actually the regulatory subunit of adenyl cyclase. It's just a different target, but the enzymatic process is exactly the same. But one of the unusual things, kind of a thematic process to these ADP ribose toxins, is if you look at all of the different toxins that do this, they generally typically um, use as their targets GTP binding proteins or sometimes ATP binding proteins. So there's some kind of similarity in how these toxins have evolved um, and, and the targets that, they, that they're associated with. Now, I kind of hesitated whether to put this slide in here or later, but this is an unrelated toxin, and I probably shouldn't put it in here now, but it's such a cool toxin, and I used to work on this toxin, that I want to mention it. So this is a toxin that actually is an adenyl cyclase. The bacterium that causes whooping cough, or pertussis, has as one of its toxins, and it has many toxins, one of its toxins is actually a secreted adenyl cyclase molecule. And that's what's shown here. This is not the scale. These little red footballs are meant to be adenyl cyclase. They can, at high concentration, poke holes in cells, but I don't think that really happens in vivo. 
Um, but what really does happen in vivo is that these um, little adenyl cyclases insert themselves into the host cell. And now rather than, like the Vibrio collar toxin does, turn on adenyl cyclase, it is an adenyl cyclase. So it hydrolyzes ATP in that host cell, turning on cyclic, making large amounts of this secondary messenger, cyclic, cyclic AMP. Um, and that intoxicates the cell to block phagocytic functions, to block the inflammatory response. So this is not an ADP ribosylating toxin. So that's why I kind of hesitated to throw it in here. But since, since you know that the ADP ribosylating toxin of Vibrio cholera um, affects adenyl cyclase, I just wanted to show you how important these secondary messengers are in terms of bacteria taking advantage of host cells. Here's an example of a, of a bacterium that has acquired the ability to insert its own adenyl cyclase inside a cell in order to, to um, intoxicate that cell. Um, that's a little bit of a, 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 a non-sequitur. you know a non -sequitur. I'm sorry, I'm going to come back now and talk about these AB toxins. Remember that this, that toxin I just mentioned is not in the same family. Um, but the cholera toxin that we talked about is actually almost identical to a toxin that um, is found frequently in E. coli strains. Particularly, uh, so the toxin is referred to in E. coli as a heat labile toxin. This is a great example of how it is that bacteria can swap DNA. So when we talked about transformation and transduction and conjugation, here's an example of why those processes are so important in bacteria. Because what we know is that that toxin gene that gives cholera toxin its kick, that causes diarrhea, has actually been spread to other bacteria in completely distinct species, such as E. coli. So not obviously, luckily, not all strains of E. coli have this heat labile toxin, which we call LTX. It's called heat labile toxin for obvious reasons. If you heat this up to about 56 degrees, the toxin um, unfolds, it, it denatures, and it's not functional. We're going to contrast that with a heat-stable toxin in a, in a few minutes. That's, that's why I make the point of talking about heat mobility. Um, but it's about 80% identical to the Vibrio cholera toxin. And it has virtually the same activity. It's just now um, in a different bacteria. So, so they act identically, both cholera toxin and labile toxin, CTX and LTX. They have the same intracellular target. They are enzymatically... Um, inactivating by putting an ADP ribose onto that regulatory subunit of adenyl cyclase in, in that cell. The strains of E. coli that have these labile toxins are referred to as ETEC, or enterotoxigenic strains of E. coli. Um, you'll, so those of you who go on in medicine will hear E. coli referred to as either ETEC, meaning enterotoxigenic, or enteropathogenic, which are referred to as, as EPEC, there are those that are uropathogenic, that you'll hear as UPEC. There, there are numerous other acronyms. But for the moment, we're talking about these ones that secrete a toxin into their environment. And this is the cause of, and I just like to collect terms for things like traveler's diarrhea. But these are the things that you try and avoid when you um, avoid going in, in other countries from you know, drinking water or eating you know, uncooked foods. You're, you're avoiding things like Montezuma's Revenge or the Aztec Two-Step. Um, there's probably more names. If you know more names, I'd like to put them in for the slide for, for next year. Or if you can make them up. I don't care if they're, they're real or not. If they're funny, I'll put them in. Um, you know, and I really shouldn't joke about this because, you know, to you and I, this is an inconvenience of, of travel. You know, we're, we're all, you know, fortunate enough to, to be able to travel recreationally many times. So, so we joke about picking up these strains of E. coli and, and getting diarrhea. And for you and I, it's generally unpleasant but not life-threatening. The problem is, is that in neonates, in toddlers, um, diarrhea is a major cause of dehydration and death in children. So in the developing world, these same strains that we kind of make fun of um, are, are actually life-threatening. Life so the diarrhea that the companies from this is actually, you can tell that it's not the cause, that you haven't actually been infected. You're, you're being intoxicated because the diarrhea has no blood, pus, or mucus in it. Um, the patient rarely has a fever or, or vomiting. So this is indicating this is an intoxication rather than a systemic infection. So in the case of um, salmonella typhi, for instance, you can become infected with that bacterium from, 
contaminated water, um, and the bacteria will actually spread throughout the body and cause a much more severe disease. So, as I mentioned, these ETEC strains are a major cause of infant mortality, um, about 800,000 cases of uh, deaths per year um, in children under five years old. So this, is, it, this really is a serious toxin. So and again, um, this is the mechanism for how this enterotoxin works. And so the nice thing about learning about E. coli label to labile toxin at a molecular mechanistic level is that you're also learning about how Vibrio cholera toxin works because they do it in the exact same way. So you have this classic AB toxin with the B subunits binding to ganglioside um, GM1 on the surface being endocytosed into, into the cell um, and then the active portion is actually going to be released from the endoplasmic reticulum. So what happens is that this toxin actually travels retrograde. So when this endosome is formed, um, it will actually now fuse with the Golgi apparatus. And the toxin, AB toxin, will actually travel backwards. So in other words, it's going from the Golgi into the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum are mechanisms that recognize unfolded proteins or proteins that need to be getting ri gotten rid of, recognize this protein as something that needs to be taken out of the endoplasmic reticulum. And again, that doesn't serve us well. So it's a normal defense mechanism to make sure that we don't have misformed or denatured proteins in our endoplasmic reticulum and to get rid of them. In this particular case, it's taking those proteins that is now a toxin and releasing it into the cell, where it can now use that enzymatic activity, again, the ADP ribosylation activity, where it's going to take that GS protein and ADP ribosylate it, locking it in or, or locking the adenyl cyclase into being phase on, so that now, or not phase on, but just on, uh, so that cyclic AMP levels rise, which affects protein kinase A, which affects protein phosphorylation of other proteins, especially the CFTR, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulatory protein. Um, and that will cause chloride to be um, put out, as well as blocking sodium um, reabsorption and water reabsorption. So that's going to lead to the toxin. And I think that's pretty much just what I covered in, in these bullets. Um, yes, the triggers receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, the toxin actually is going to be, based on acidification, is going to end up in the cytoplasm. Now, one-third of enterotoxigenic E. coli, so now we're moving on to a different kind of toxin. One-third of ETEC strains do not produce that heat labile toxin, that large multi-protein um, AB toxin. They instead produce a smaller toxin, which is called the heat-stable toxin, or ST. It's heat-stable, I mean, in part because it's so small. It's a peptide. It's only about 18 to 19 amino acids um, long. And it has a lot of disulfide linkages. So it's a very stable protein. So you can heat this to 56 degrees, and it just laughs at you. It's still going to be completely toxigenic. So this is being produced by about one-third of, of ETEC strains. Um, this particular uh, toxin never itself becomes internalized. This toxin, again, works through secondary messengers, but it doesn't require access to an internal um, site inside the cell. So here's the stable toxin rep represented by this black square that has the ability to bind to a receptor here called guanylate cyclase. Guanylate cyclase, when it binds, and it binds normally to a, a hormone whose name escapes me at the moment. It might be here in my um, bullets someplace. Um, but the normal agonist for guanylate cyclase is a hormone that will now cause the hydrolysis of GTP to generate cyclic GTP, GMP, um, which will activate a protein kinase G, which will also activate the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. So again, you see that this CFTR protein is very important in terms of causing diarrhea. So both, um, it's targeted by both labile toxin and stable toxin. So this protein becomes actively on, it's transporting chloride out, water flows out to kind of satisfy that um, osmotic 
imbalance that's, that's occurred. And the bacteria here in, this, in the lumen are now washed out into this very non-viscous fecal matter, this fluid diarrhea. So it's much easier for those bacteria to gain access to water supply. Um, they get washed into the water supply and, to, and then to um, infect, infect more people. Now, the particularly cruel thing about the stable toxins, and this is part of the reason why this is so dangerous for children, is that in the developmental biology of children, of us, toddlers tend to express much more of this receptor, the guanylate cyclase C. Once you get above four or five years old, you're, you don't express as much of this. So the toxin is not as effective uh, against us, but it's particularly effective against children. So this is part of the reason why these ETEX strains are so lethal for, for small children, because they have more of this receptor for, for the toxin. So it's a devastating disease for, for small children. Now, a little bit of a side note, because so we've shown here now, you've seen at least three different times where this cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator comes into play in infectious diseases. And so people have wondered for a long time why it is that the cystic fibrosis gene has um, maintained itself for so long in the population of people of European descent. So people have hypothesized, and there is some evidence to support it, that there's actually an advantage to being heterozygous for cystic fibrosis. According to this particular slide, and I've seen numbers of different, one in 28 Caucasians, and these are usually people of European descent, um, are heterozygous for cystic fibrosis. And so those of you, don't, so I happen to be one of those one in 28 people. Um, my, one of my brothers actually suffered with cystic fibrosis, and that's the reason why I'm so interested in disease today um, and why I'm interested in microbiology. Um, but, a, but other numbers say about 2% of Caucasians are, are heterozygous. And so homozygous people have cystic fibrosis, right? The, it's a, a homozygous recessor. Um, what people have really believed for a long time now is that people like me who are heterozygous for CFTR produce slightly less of, or not slightly less, we produce one half the amount of functional CFTR. So in terms of being um, susceptible to diarrheal diseases in this type of intoxication, there's a potential that these people were actually protected from things like typhoid fever um, and from cholera. So, so there's a belief that, that um, Salmonella typhi, for instance, actually uses CFTR to gain access to the, to the cell. And so in people who are either have CF or have only one functional allele, they're perhaps protected from Salmonella typhi. There's actually a competing hypothesis because what people have realized or, or done with mathematical models and looking at historical data, it turns out that in Europe, not enough people, this sounds horrible to say, not enough people were killed by typhoid fever and cholera to explain the selective um, advantage to cystic fibrosis. Unlike tuberculosis, between about 1600, or about 1300 and 1600, um, tuberculosis killed about 30%, I think, of the European population. And so there's now a belief that actually having um, one allele defective for CFTR makes people more resistant to tuberculosis. And it's actually been shown, it's very rare for people with cystic fibrosis to actually get tuberculosis. There are, very, there are only a few cases in the medical reports. There's some other enzymatic activity associated with people with CF that, um, that mycobacterium tuberculosis needs in order to live in, in the lung. But in either case, there seems to be some advantage to why it is that CF has been maintained in, in the population. Um, and actually, it's, it's interesting that now, as tuberculosis has become, since 1800, much more spread in South Asia, in, in India, for instance, the current um, incidence of cystic fibrosis is one out of 40,000 people, whereas it's one out of 3,000 people of European um, heritage. So people are believing that now that as tuberculosis has a longer and longer history in South Asia, that there's going to be new mutations that um, affect the CFTR. So it'll be inter we won't know the answer to that for, for many years, but it does seem as if there is at least some increase in the Indian population in mutations in, in the CFTR. So this is just a, a picture I found um, from a review article 
showing, so in the, here would be Vibrio cholerae producing the cholera toxin, binding to a G-protein G coupled receptor, and activating adenyl cyclase to give you the cyclic AMP levels, which will now, through a cascade, turn on the CFTR to pump out chloride. However, if you're a CF patient or you have only one of these, then the cyclic AMP level rises don't have the, as significant effect in, in, cause, in terms of causing diarrhea. So you may be more likely to survive that infection. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how exotoxins are delivered. So one of the chief ways, so all of the toxins that we've talked about right now, whether it's cholera toxin, diphtheria toxin, even the adenyl cyclase toxin of, of Bordetella, are probably all delivered by a kind of a classic protein pathway that you've already learned perfectly well and remember greatly, the type 2 secretion pathway. So this is the pathway that looks a lot like how pillin uh, or pili are produced, where you have protein being translocated from the cytoplasm into the periplasm, where they actually ride on an elevator, a pillus-like elevator. They're pushed out through this pore and released to, to the environment. So this would be the way cholera toxin is, is released, or heat labile toxin, or heat stable toxin. They're all released by, by this particular way. Um, we don't really need to go through, again, how, how pili are, are produced. I probably shouldn't put that slide in there. But, so that's a really, so that's a very important pathway, but I want to spend the last of our time today talking about what I think is an even more fascinating type of secretion called type 3 protein secretion. There are seven, at least seven, well-characterized protein secretion pathways in bacteria. Um, we're only going to get through type, type 3. But it's really fascinating because this type of, of secretion system actually secretes virulence factors not into the environment, where they can just diffuse away and maybe hit their target. This is a really directed secretion. In type 3 secretion, the protein passes directly from the cytoplasm of the bacterium directly into the cytoplasm of the cell about to be infected. There, it's a straight delivery system. In essence, it becomes a hypodermic needle. So these virulence factors, and this is usually found or only found in gram-negative bacteria, go from the cytoplasm across both the plasma membrane uh, an outer membrane and directly into the, into the host cell. And it's actually needle-like in, in structure and shapes. You can see them in the electron on micrographs. And these secreted proteins go through a hollow channel. In essence, kind of like a, a, a flagellum. As a matter of fact, here is a type 3 secretion system shown in cartoon. And if this looks similar to a flagellum, well, I think the artist actually kind of had that in mind. They were trying to show this to you. But in terms of the structural molecules, the proteins that are put together into these type 3 systems, they really are related to flagella um, biosynthesis. As a matter of fact, this is probably co-opted from flagellar biosynthesis. So, so what we learned about how flagella are put together in other bacteria have been modified, duplicated probably, and modified so that now, um, rather than pushing subunits of flagellin out through this hollow pore to polymerize at the end to make, make, more, um, make the flagellum longer, this portion of the needle is actually going to puncture the host cell to make a conduit directly between the cytoplasm of, of those two cells. These um, type 3 systems are actually on genetic parasites. They're not, people still don't know where in the hell they came from. Because what we know now that we can look at genomic um, whole genome sequences is that these type 3 secretion systems are often encoded on portions of the genome known as pathogenicity islands. In other words, these are collections of genes that are found in one particular area. Um, they're not spread throughout the chromosome. And when you look at that area that has all of these proteins that encode the type 3 secretion system, if you look at the percentage of guanosine and cytosine, in the neighboring area, you'll see that, for instance, in E. coli, um, it's about 50% G plus C. This differs from bacteria to bacteria. Helicobacter tends to be about 37%. But what we almost always see in these type 3 systems, the, gen the genes that encode them, we'll see a significant decrease in the G plus C content, indicating that this portion of the chromosome is very different. It came at a different time. The rest of the chromosome is largely the same percentage of G plus C, 50%, in the case of E. coli. 
But now these islands can be picked out. You can actually spot them very easily with a computer program or particular algorithm to look for areas that have higher A and T regions, these pathogenicity islands. So this makes up um, a genomic island, which can encode these type 3 secretion systems. So I'm going to show you a series of... Um, these are a little bit old now. I actually saw these animations, so just for historical purposes, because these won't blow you away in 2016 the way they did me in about 1999 when I saw them in a science meeting. This was back in the day when PowerPoint was just coming into its floor. Most people did talks with 35 millimeter slides. So first of all, to be watching a PowerPoint slide was uh, presentation in, in 99 was really cool. But to have this guy, Brett Finley, from the University of British Columbia, who is an expert on enteropathogenic E. coli, show these animations was really, was really cool. And after saying that, I hope it works. So here is an enteropathogenic E. coli, not enterotoxigenic E. coli. Um, and these are, they look like flagella, but they're, they're meant to represent pili. So this E. coli is now coming into contact with a cell, hopefully not in your intestine. Um, but what it's going to do is it's using those type 4 pili, it's going to form a non-intimate um, interaction with that cell. It just binds, but not very tightly. Um, so what this bacterium can do is to, once it's established that non-intimate relationship, so it doesn't have the ability to bind specifically to that cell, what it's going to do is it's going to use, come on, baby. It's, here we go. It's going to use its type 3 secretion system, um, shown here. So here, the needle comes out in, in, only in terms of contact, and it forms this hollow pore. The first protein that comes through that pore is actually going to form a, a membrane pore in the eukaryotic cell, in the intestinal cell. So now there is a conduit between these two cells. Now what you're going to see coming through here is a protein called TIR, or translocated intamin receptor. This is a bacterial protein that's being secreted by this type 3 system directly into your intestinal cells, where it becomes phosphorylated. The host, your cell, recognizes that as a normal protein. And it sees a signal on it that says, oh, I've got to phosphorylate that tyrosine molecule right there. And these proteins actually insert themselves into the membrane of your, of your cell. Now, what's the purpose of that? When you come back out and look at this, these other proteins that are shown here are called intamin. These are bacterial outer membrane proteins that actually bind to that translocated intamin receptor. So how evil is this? This bacterium comes to a new host, that bacteria, that host cell doesn't have the proper receptor in order to bind to that cell. So what does it do? It inserts the receptor into the host cell so that now it can bind to that receptor. So in essence, it could bind, it could do this with virtually any cell. So then, in the last of these animations, and so you can hear gasps from the microbiologists in the, you know, sitting here watching this cartoon in 1999. Inside the cell, this phosphorylated transmembrane, or, or excuse me, translocated intamin receptor will now recruit various proteins that are involved in the cytoskeleton. So what you're seeing here, these little gold spheres, are actin monomers. So the, now the host cell cyto, cytoskeleton is now um, working for the bacterium on the outside. So you get these large polymers of actin, which is going to change the structure of the bacterial membrane. So when you go back out and look at this, as it will in just a second, to the outside of this cell, you can see that the bacterium is now raised up onto a pedestal. It's away from um, the rest of the cell. People still to this day don't know what the exact um, reason that this pedestal helps the bacterium. But what we do know is that this intoxication and the formation of this pedestal changes the physiology of that host cell such that now the cell releases a lot of nitrate. That bacterium that's shown here on this pedestal is probably not going to get transmitted in the diarrhea that's about to occur. This protein, or this bacterium is probably stuck to that cell until the cell is sloughed off. But this cell is now so changed in its physiology that one of the things that happens is that large amounts of nitrate are released into the lumen of the, of the host. Remember what nitrate does for bacteria. 
this, for those of you who haven't taken the um, practical yet, this is a little bit of an advantage. Sorry for those of you who have already taken it. But nitrate, now present in that lumen at a higher concentration, is going to allow the brethren E. coli, the E. coli that are not attached and forming this pedestal, to undergo anaerobic respiration. They've, up to this point, they've been surviving based on fermentation, which is not very um, efficient. Oxygen is not present in the colon, so aerobic respiration is impossible. But anaerobic respiration is now possible because nitrate is being produced. So all of the brethren cells of this EPEC cell living in the lumen can now increase their numbers tremendously. So that the diarrhea that results um, as a result of this change in the morphology of this cell will now wash out huge numbers of EPEC cells into a watery diarrhea where they can spread to, to new hosts. And so this cartoon just kind of shows, for those of you who are cell biologists, the names of some of these host proteins that are now um, uh, helping to, to recruit or nucleate the, the actin molecule. This is a, a false color um, electron micrograph that um, another researcher, um, he had a hard time finding someone that would publish this for, for a long time, but um, here is the actual pedestals. You can see the microvilli are largely being denuded, um, and then they've, they've changed the color on this. Now, last point about these type 3 systems is because everybody uses them slightly differently. That pedestal formation that is, is, causes a lesion called an attaching and effacing lesion. That's not the important point. The important point is that other bacteria like Salmonella, which is a really nasty gastrointestinal pathogen, is actually an intracellular pathogen. It exists inside of cells. And the way that it does it is kind of similar to the way the EPEC um, just changed the cytoskeleton to raise its cell up on a pedestal. But it's the opposite in Salmonella. Salmonella uses a type 3 secretion system, just like E. coli did, and it puts in a toxic molecule, shown here as effector proteins, which change the actin cytoskeleton. But now what happens is that it induces its own endocytosis, not into an endosome, um, but into um, a different type of a vacuole in the cytoplasm. That's where Salmonella lives. E. coli lives free in the lumen of the intestinal tract. Salmonella wants to be inside of cells. It uses a type 3 secretion system to secrete its toxin directly into the host cell. Never mind this business of just releasing it into the environment, like heat labile toxin, and hoping that it finds the right cell to bind to. Here it delivers it directly in, changes the actin polymerization characteristics, and causes this membrane ruffling, which is eventually going to swallow that salmonella. And that's exactly what salmonella wants. It will reproduce inside of that vacuole. The, the host cell has a very difficult time killing it. And that's actually where um, salmonella prefers to be. And yep, that's as far as we're going to go today. So I'll see you guys on Friday. Lauren, I'm sorry, I played a joke on you. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, it's like, whose name am I going to call out? Who's, who am I going to pick on? See, this is the disadvantage of sitting in the front row. <laughs>